Uh, you can take it out of its static. Don't worry, it's a demo model. That's an NVIDIA Tesla. Uh, and uh, they have that particular model that you hold in your hand. Um, they have 260 quarter million of these attached to AMD processors. And they're providing the floating point capability. And because of that, it can reach 17.59 teraflops or 17.59 quadrillion calculations per second. So how much is that thing worth? That, how much is it worth? The yeah. whole machine? Yeah, no, so this thing you have in your oh, hand. Oh, this guy. So this is just a video card. Well, not quite, not quite. It is a video card, but it's got a lot of extras in it. It's got a lot of extras, and I'll show an architecture of that. In order to get 261,000 processors, they don't have 261,000 of these cards, right? I mean, they've got they've got boards with with yes. lots of these chips. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. Each one of those, I think, is maybe 512 cores or something. Okay. So there's several hundreds of these <laughs> boards out there. But that um, board or, or the a, a special board for there's a special yeah. board. Yeah, that is a more commercial, but inside the electronics is. Still the same as those in those cameras. Not like they ran down the Best Buy and pick up. No, no, no. <laughs> and then in terms of market share, Intel has about 76, AMD is 12 percent. IBM has the rest. Uh, and uh, this includes the Craze and Dells who buy from both AMD and Intel. And the number two is at Lawrence Livermore. Let's actually take a picture or show you this. And there's a uh, URL. You can go there. That's the machine Titan. You know, when you pay so much and get a big system, they custom the skins for you. <laughs> <laughs> we used to do that. We were in trade. So what color do you like? Yeah. And it can be any color, even black if you want. Uh, and uh, uh, the previous one was called Jaguar. And they actually had a <coughs> Jaguar uh, cat you know, embroidered on the side and all that. And uh, that's, that's what it looks like from the top. You know. And all of these are special cooling. You see that little hat uh, sort of thing at the top? That's a special heat collection and dispersal device mm -hmm. designed especially for this. So that's the number one system for the next 24 to 48 hours. And another one will be in China. And we'll have to look at all the people who the back in. There's that the new Chinese one. Well, we'll see what the Chinese one is. I actually have seen a picture three years ago of the data center that was being built. And maybe I should have brought it. Uh, if you ever go on I-94 <laughs> and you're getting close to Chicago, you pass this limestone quarry, which is like big. Mm. It's bigger than that. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just been excavated. And you could tell because they put a picture of a dump truck in the middle uh, of it. Uh -huh. And they put a scale also that it's about 30 feet. And then you <coughs> measure those and you say, oh, that's a very big hole. And that's just a special data center for that 100 petaflop machine. This particular machine here that I'm showing did not have the skins put on. So they wanted to show all the cooling coils and electrical coils and fiber optic coils. And here the hot aisle, cold aisles, and all that sort of stuff, electrical and stuff at the top. That's the number two system that's built by um, uh, I IBM, and it's called the Sequoia. Um, that's it. Uh, IBM's uh, Sequoia. That's not sure. <coughs> that's what it looks like, and it uses a special stripped-down version of their power chip architecture, um, and it's uh, uh, a fairly low clock speed, 700 megahertz, but it has uh, quite a few of them. Uh, I think perhaps <coughs> more than the number one system, but they're AMD's with the GPUs. There's no GPU out here. Well. Let's come to the fun part. What do we use this for? Well, lots of fun stuff. You know, things we can't do otherwise. Um, weather, automotive, traditional <coughs> scientists, all the nuclear energy, oil and gas, and these days bioinformatics. I am very familiar with the automotive and aerospace stuff, so I brought examples of actual uh, things that my machines did while I was there. Mm -hmm. So I kept uh, copies. Uh, the car crash is perhaps one that everyone in this room can relate to. Uh, in the old days, they used to physically uh, crash a car. 
and you'd have technicians, material, and all that, you make a mistake, repeat it. Each physical crash used to cost half a million dollars. When they found that they could simulate it and improve the algorithm so that the simulation could exactly duplicate a physical crash, they found out that they could actually do it for $5,000 each crash. And now they can do many more of them and improve the vehicle. So let me show you a little example. Yes, it still does a real crash, Only if required. They accept digital results these days. Yeah. So they only do uh, for a brand new design. If it's a derivative, no need. Uh, this is an actual video of how crash uh, used to be done. Uh, please pay attention and let me see if I can get this started up here. Watch the guy on the right. <laughs> He, he started to go. Yeah, he jumped out. Did he jump out of the car? Yes. He yes. started to go in there and jumped out. Uh, that's uh, from uh, Jim's uh, backyard, Water uh, Milford. That's yeah. the Milford Proving right. Ground. Is that right? 1956. And of course, you probably have seen this in commercials. Oh, yeah. You know, the airbag and all that. It's a crash dummy, yeah. Yeah. So uh, let, let's play this again. I want to see that guy jump, jump off that running board. <laughs> <laughs> he was very adept at it. Too bad that simulation has put him out of work, but I think he's happier for it. Wow. <laughs> this is how we do it uh, these days. Uh, let's see if I can get this guy started. And that you all recognize is uh, a van. As you can see, um, we, we've actually dumbed down the graphics so that we could fit the size in. But uh, here's another one. Uh, computational fluid dynamics is a very popular one. And what we're doing is simulating the rain on the side view mirror and the uh, uh, driver's side so that we can improve the A-pillar and many of the uh, outlines so that the water can flow away and do many other things. Um, the driver's side window, they want to make sure the water comes inside. Yeah, all, all <laughs> sorts of things there, all sorts of things there. Uh, This one I like because uh, my friend Jim Johnson, I ran into Jim last week at the ANSYS conference. He retired, but he and I worked on this. And if you're all familiar that, uh, when you fill gas in the gas tank, um, in the old days, there were actually problems where they, uh, you'd have vapor emitting out of it. It could catch fire. And they advise you not to fill it completely. And they have all sorts of things. Well, this is a design to actually simulate the temperature and pressure of that vapor out there. As you can see, uh, that's where you fill the gas. That's where it comes in the gas line. Those are the tanks. And the vapor out there causes a lot of back pressure. And they try to figure out how can you have designs so that the vapor and uh, fluid levels uh, don't uh, intrude on each other and cause you know, a possible explosion. So uh, this is very interesting. And I only brought one. But this is just the mass fraction of the vapor. There's another one for temperature. So they can change the design and keep it below, well below ignition temperature or keep that. So these are real applications of high performance computing being used to make your life easier. Um, and uh, you asked that question about the National Highway Transportation Safety. Well, take a look at this. This is from a few years ago. That's the actual test. On the left, on the right is a simulated. They went and measured what was the actual bending of the metal and the one that was predicted by the computer on the right. And it was uh, accurate to 0 0.01 millimeter. Wow. Which direction did they do that? Did they run the simulation and then run the test? Uh, this uh, is a 30 uh, miles per hour center pole. They actually uh, had test results from previous uh, physical tests. So they used that to make sure that they could design the simulation parameters. And when they ran it, they measured what the predicted was, repeated the test, because that car model wasn't available, and it came out well within engineering tolerance. And so they repeated it all across the vehicles. I know I was there at GM at that time. They were able to replace 112 physical tests by just seven final ones to submit to the NTSA. And the rest they all simulated. 112 physical tests? Yes. Went down to seven? It went down to seven. Wow. What a cost saving.
it paid for it so many times over. But they can run they can run the simulated ones thousands of times. Right. Yes, exactly. And tweak things and change yes. yeah. And that is and why that. they didn't have to go back and say oh, we made a design change, marketing didn't like it, it's gotta have this. Well, let's calculate the physics and does it still get the five star rating? Good. You don't have to physically test it, you can just build it. <laughs> Uh, did they do the old Henry Ford thing and go to the junkyard, buy a total car to have just measure that one? I don't think so. <laughs> well, despite HPC providing so much power that you can simulate, there are a few challenges which we need. Let me see if I can show you this. Anybody recognize what that is? Remember we're in Detroit. That's an airbag. Guess what? That is still a challenging compute problem. Why? Because the geometry is changing all the time. The volume is changing all the time. The density is changing. So your calculations have to be repeated for every time step of the way and the whole parameter changes. So this poses still a computational challenge. But I'm sure they'll overcome it uh, with more powerful hardware. And uh, In fact, in crash test, all the simulations that I showed you they are between 60 to 200 milliseconds. Doing a simulation beyond 300 milliseconds is pointless because all the energy is dissipated in the first few 30, 40 milliseconds. Because, you know, kinetic energy, you're suddenly stopping it. So where does it get transmitted? They have the metal and the different composite structures absorb all of that so there's less physical injury. And this is one challenge that remains, and probably they'll solve this as well. And uh, like I said, uh, you anticipated my question. They do require one physical validation. And uh, now we just do about 11 or 12 tests. That's it. In fact, the 112 was when I was there. When I left, they added a few more safety, like uh, SUV rollover. So they simulate. So it's now about 140. Um, many more things happen. First of all, we decrease the cost. In those days, it used to take five years to come out with a new car model. Now it takes one year, all because of HPC. And conversely, you can do many more designs. Instead of 100 physical ones with people hunched over slide rules or CAD machines, you know, you can do thousands of them and, and come in the same time frame. So it's been really good. Um, I, I like this particular one. Let me show you this simulation. They basically use HPC in the design of vehicle in every part. There are about seven to 12,000 parts. I'd say a good uh, three to 4,000 of them, they're all designed with high performance computing. So you see the gearbox, transmission, steering, yeah. uh, crankshaft, the CFD, the entire vehicle. Even road conditions can be simulated. And, uh, well, the Michigan roads might break the computer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why we still have to go deep right? enough. Huh? They have to do that physical test. So this kind of video captures all the different components that you know are used here. Okay. Yeah, really cool. yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, let me like add roll. that GPU yeah. you're holding in your hand, wherever yeah, it's right, circulating. Right, right. Uh, if everyone has a chance, uh, it really speeds things up. Let me show you one little thing. Uh, uh, I got this from a automotive supplier, so uh, it runs a little slow, but bear with me. But it, it does show that on the left is pure CPU only. This <coughs> is using Intel Sandy Bridge 16 cores. The one is same CPUs plus GPUs, and look how fast it's uh, completed the simulation. And this is the easiest CFD, external aerodynamics. So it's really, you know, almost three to four times faster. Um, let me show you another one. This is really cool also. And this uses that Tesla card that's in front of you. Um, this is a supplier called Fluid Dyna. And uh, this is done with a BMW. OK, it's not a Detroit car, but who cares? Yeah. This is the X3 SUV. And look. The one at the left is still calculating, and this one is gone ahead and told you all the turbulence that's happening at the back here. Mm -hmm. And this is just 25 times faster on a real code. 
they're building, if you look at the road map, they want to go to 100 to 1,000 times faster so that you could easily, you know, with one click figure it all out. There. I'm going to skip all this eye chart and tell you that there's still problems that we'd like to solve. There are problems that we cannot do with physical tests anymore. For example, climate change. You're not going to release contaminants. <laughs> You're going to actually simulate it and then say this is what's most likely going to happen. And we have proof that it works. Chernobyl, when did that happen? Yeah. <laughs> That's correct. And then with Craze, they actually simulated where the nuclear cloud is going and they repeated those experiments with Fukushima about two, three years ago. So they knew exactly what areas will be affected. They went and set up barriers and evacuated them. They did all of that. But these are the kind of things that you can do and you can only do with high performance computing. Um, of course, the people, the astronomers, they like to do supernova and things. Well, you can't do that in a lab on Earth. So you gotta simulate it. Um, of course, uh, you saw the crash testing stuff. You don't have to put that guy who jumped off that running board, his life in danger. Simulate it. The one I like the best is this one, the future energy. You've all heard of fusion energy. Well, the problem is how do you build a reactor that'll keep 6,000 degrees Kelvin? So they're trying to figure out how do we design this? Um, in Berkeley and Livermore lab, they have a, a ignition facility where they shine lasers on a small pellet of heavy hydrogen to start a reaction, and they're trying to figure out the laser part. What they're doing is using supercomputers to design a magnetic container so that they could keep the energy inside of it, but then once it starts, use that energy to keep those magnets focused on it. And that's called the ITER project. Yeah inter something, thermonuclear, whatever, mm -hmm. but it is real. You can look it up there. And it's got a, a budget of $20 billion, and it's not US alone. Every country in the world is contributing to it, yeah. and they're using this here. Yeah. Well, um, you all say this is fine and dandy, but you know, uh, dollars and cents, okay. Well, let me tell you, uh, first of all, about the performance. We all know about performance, it's great, but Here's some actual numbers. In 1988, that's the year I joined Cray, the YP8 processor, it had one gigaflops of okay, speed. Well, since then, they've had these massive parallel machines, thinking machines, Intel Delta, Intel Paragraph, ASCII Red, there you go, 1997. It could do, uh, you know, the one teraflop, ASCII Blue, then the Earth Simulator, and then the massively parallel processor, Blue G. That's the Cray XT at 200,000 cores. And that's scaled to gigaflops. We've actually, in two <coughs> years, at six orders of magnitude, where an order of magnitude is 10 times, we have six times we've had that order of magnitude. So the performance is great. We know how to get performance here. And these are all actual applications that they were measured on. Well, what about the cost? In 1989, uh, if you calculated the cost of the machine, the electricity, the cooling, floor, the salaries of the people, the cost of the software, per megaflop, it was about 2,000, you know, between two and 3,000 dollars. Today, that same thing would cost less than 24 cents, and if you add the GPU part, then it's even less. And so we've had a similar now, five plus order of magnitude improvement in the cost. That's in 2001, well, 2009. Yeah, yeah. Now, four years later, it's probably quite a bit. Wow. Well, definitely, yes, it is. So, things have improved. That's why they're very hopeful of trying to build a machine. Why do we need those kind of machines? Why do we need more? Well, we have to have more capability. You saw there are problems we can't solve. We have more complexity, there are simplified versions. Real life, when you want to mimic real life, you have to add every variable, get better understanding. And of course, there's all that data that's been generated when you run the simulation. So you kind of tie it all in together. And remember my talk from a few months ago, we talked about data, where we generate so much data that we like the data to tell you what's the physics going on there, what's the science behind that. Then there's actually a government science report you can go to that uh, URL and download this PDF. 
it talks about all the problems that you could solve if you had that exaflock machine today. And there's about 20 different projects, I think, that they talked about. And so uh, what I'd like to sort of conclude here, uh, do I have a few more minutes yet? Yeah. Yeah. Is uh, what will the uh, future HPC look like? We don't know. But we can't speculate. What sort of architecture will it be? One thing I do know is electricity will be a big, 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 big deciding factor. So uh, a lot of folks think, well, why don't we just stay the course? I don't think that will solve the problem, uh, especially you know uh, if you look at um, you know some of the uh, power consumption. What's it for a sandy bridge? It's what 90 and 110 or 135 watts. That's a lot. I like the rice, raspberry pie. It's what five watts each is. So it's definitely an alternative. Nvidia is aiming for a sub one watt high performance computing processor. Because if you want to have an extra fluff, you need a million cores. <laughs> a million divide, multiplied by 130 watts today, um, you'd have to suck half the world's electricity just to run one machine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 1.21 gigawatts. Something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gigawatts. Uh, uh, who is that uh, back to the future, that, yeah. the yeah. professor? I like the way he used that word gigawatts yeah. or something. Yeah. So uh, uh, energy is going to be a big problem. Um, this particular chart actually, remember I said memory is a big part of it? It's not the compute, the floating point that consumes energy. What is really consumed is moving those bytes from the memory to the processor and back. That takes a lot of energy. And there are people who have computed this at the picojoule level chip-to-chip -chip communication, node-to-node -node communication within a node, and what's it supposed to look like in 2018? What does it cost now? And if we have to build a machine with a million cores, that will take so many, you know, picojoule per operation. And we've got to get it well below that because if you stay on the trend, then we're talking many, a lot of energy. So it would take actually easily more than 100 megawatts. What they said, all right, we can't do 100 megawatts, let's settle for 20 megawatts. So we'll build one machine and use 20 megawatts. So everyone's designing around that. And uh, memory is the biggest part. So if you look at some of the technology, I apologize for this graininess, but these are the kind of technologies, and if they use the advanced versions that are in the labs, that likely consume 100 megawatts, but if they use a future JDEC, which will take uh, 30 picojoules per operation, they might be able to achieve that. That's your design parameter. So we don't know where we'll get there, uh, but it's still in the lab. That's why I'm kind of uh, you know, not so sure. If you look at um, memory density, how many megabits you can fit on a chip, you know, for quite some time it was pretty linear. But around 2005, it started dropping off, and it's actually dropping further and further. This is the kind of densities we're seeing. We're at like uh, one gigabit and two gigabit uh, chip densities. It's actually going to drop further and further. So we're going to have a problem there. So folks in the... Well, aren't you coming up to the size of an atom or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Well, what it is, is it's the separation for eight eight to nine nanometers where you cannot stop capacitance leakage. Right. So it's a problem. You can't figure it out. It's physics, you know. Damn it, Jim, I'm a, <laughs> a software programmer, not a hardware right. Um And then, of course, uh, what is the cost? Guess what? Uh, while uh, compute has been coming down drastically, that's dollars per megaflop, but dollars per megabyte has been very slow. So. You know, we focused all our energies on this, but this didn't matter since this was the big determining factor. Now that this is cheap, 90% of all our bottlenecks are in the memory. So we got to worry about that. <coughs> um, let's uh, just go here. So we've got to figure out how to do this and uh, what sort of processors we're going to need. Uh, and how much parallelism we need. We need something that can do a billion parallel tasks. A billion parallel tasks. How do you write software that will even figure it out? We don't know yet. 
So we don't have anything practical or useful. This is where we are today. This is where we want to be in 2018. And as you can see, it should be a billion per clock cycle. That's the dashed line. If we stay with the current technology, we'll fall way short. So we have a problem. The GPU people, they say we have a solution. That's what the current architecture of a GPU looks like. You've got the GPU here, the GPU memory attached to it. They use a PCI Express, the regular chip, and all that. Well, that's not going to work. Here's what they want to do. They have an architecture called Echelon and Dragonfly. And there's uh, documents describing these. And that's what it will look like where they'll mesh the CPU and GPU all on the same silicon. And several thousand of them on the same silicon. And we're assuming silicon densities will bail us out. So that's what it'll look like. And these are all the technologies that we still have to come up with. They're all theoretical right now. Yeah. I don't even know what some of these are. Collective engines, uh, PGAS, well, this I know. Uh, uh, global addressable, parallel global addressable uh, memory is PGAS. But many of these, uh, they're still uh, theories, you know, that they think that by 2018 they can implement in silicon. And of course, uh, I like the pie myself. You saw a version of this uh, circulating. It's actually very cool that for what I think will happen is that the bulk of the folks, they're not going to worry about these billion dollar exaflop machines, but they say, how can we compute what we are interested in faster and cheaper? And I expect to see these kind of machines, you know, be all over the universities and labs and industries and they'll dominate and uh, simply you want an answer, let's go to the next door Raspberry Pi cluster and let's build a few thousand of these clusters, each with several thousand cores and uh, you know, for maybe less than a uh, hundred grand we can have something that will give us an answer. Um, those of you who want to know, well, what sort of things will future computers look like, that's what they'll all have to have. Brand new architecture, totally different way of doing compute and memory. And of course, we'll be using it in all of these fields. Everyone will have an application. And so what's going to happen in jobs in the future, you just can't be a sysadmin anymore. You've got to be a sysadmin with application smarts. So, you know, you can't just say, yeah, I know Linux and this, but you got to know what the problem is, help map it on. So there are so many uh, things, life sciences, healthcare, the geophysics, we all know about financial modeling, and how can we use clusters and map the problems. So that's what we'll have to work on. So that sort of brings me towards the end. Uh, I I'll continue to entertain questions. But before <laughs> we go ahead, a little bit of humor. This is actually, uh, it appeared in the Knoxville uh, Sen Senatorial. Sentinel, that's a uh, newspaper out there. So that's Oak Ridge National Lab. And they said, oh, so you've got a powerful computer? Can you ask it how are we going to beat Alabama in a football game next year? And that's what they want to know about. And uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, they actually, the city invested in a supercomputer, hoping to attract <coughs> industrial uh, investment. But the local newspaper had a very different idea. They thought that the local mayor would play SimCity on it or something. Okay. I like this one. Yeah. As you know, most movies, they use a lot of special effects and CGI. Uh, I like The Hobbit with its uh, 3G, uh, 3D effects. It was great. So uh, you can actually buy a used uh, baby cray on eBay today for a few thousand bucks. And it will run in food. You have to just make sure you have three-phase power supply. <laughs> okay. And we all know about uh, Watson, the IBM Watson, the one that won the Jeopardy challenge. Now, uh, I'd like to see it answer that question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. It won that battle, didn't it? Watson. Yes, not for the that questions question. that asked, but not this not question. Not that question, yeah. no, but it won the battle. I'd like to see it answer that question. Uh, that, that, that answer well, might so be a little political. <laughs> so it would be interesting to see if the questions were actually triggered or, you know, orientated toward data retrieval rather than, you know, figuring out puzzles and things, right? 
Well, uh, they devised algorithms that could retrieve that fast. They fed it with every possible information and it created tree structures right inside that that it could search through. It kept the whole thing in uh, RAM. The whole thing was in RAM. Remember I talked about primary RAM starting at one terabyte? Um, I don't know how much it was, but it was several, several terabytes and about 7,000 processors. I'm just saying. Well, you're that implying what? Memory or wisdom? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>